This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. After decades of stable, even slightly improving income inequality, Australia has suffered a sharp widening of its income distribution over the past few years. And that's strange as it's been a time of very low unemployment. If you want a job, you can pretty much go out and get one. Denise Doiron has looked at exactly why in the Academy of the Social Sciences of Australia's Fagare Lecture at the Australian School of Business, where she's an Associate Professor of Economics. So, Denise, Let's go over a little bit of the history here. Why, why in, oh, certainly over the past 20 or 30 years, were we seeing income inequality really converging? A variety of factors. Inequality was really quite stable and even declining over the 60s and 70s, mainly due to the increase in tertiary education enrollments. Starting in the early 80s, however, we've seen a large shift in earnings inequality, and that has driven income inequality to increase over that period. Now, the fascinating thing about Australia is that um, even though income inequality um, through earnings, through the labor market, was going up over the whole period starting in the early 80s, we've seen a stability in the income inequality over the 90s. And that's a big, a big puzzle. And in the lecture, I was teasing out the reasons for that discrepancy between highly increasing earnings inequality through the labor market and a stable income inequality across households. And the big reason for that is because of the sharp increase in female employment in Australia over this period. So, especially women in two adult households with children were going back into the labor market in large numbers over the 90s. And that stopped the earnings inequality from feeding through into the income inequality across households. Now, in the 2000s, earnings inequality was rising very rapidly. And that is due to a phenomenon which is prevalent, uh, especially in the OECD countries, but other countries as well. And that's the very rapid increase in earnings at the top. So people at the top of the earnings distribution are having very high increases in their salaries. And that's driving a higher inequality in earnings, and the employment growth could not keep up with that. So is it really banded then that people at the top you see are really high in equality, but if you look at, say, the middle part of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the workforce, say your average middle manager, then there isn't really nearly as much inequality there? There is inequality within each group, within genders, within age groups, within occupations, within industries, within regions, within educational groups. All groups you see inequality going up. But it's how fast the increases in salary are occurring for the different groups, which matter as well for the overall distribution. And there what we see is people in management, in supervisory roles, financial planning, uh, those kinds of occupations have had huge increases in salary, much more rapid than other occupations. In fact, in Australia, over the 2000s, the bottom incomes were not growing at all, according to ABS figures. So with the top growing, the bottom not growing, the middle was growing some, somewhat, you had to have this increase in inequality. And the growth in employment could not compensate for that. You have to have employment changes in the right parts of the distribution to keep inequality in overall households to go up. And that's what women's employment was doing, because women are located in the bottom of the earnings distribution, mostly, and in the middle, but not, not so much at the top compared to men. And so when they were increasingly rejoining the labor market after having children, what you saw is really a dampening of the forces driving the income inequality growth. And how about the situation in the rest of the world? Because the, the situation isn't unique to Australia, is it? 
Well, yes. So inequality has been growing more rapidly in countries like the U.S., for example, where employment is stagnating, even declining. In European countries as well, Nordic countries have much more centralized uh, wage determination systems. And so they have tended to experience much flatter inequality trends. Um, so a lot of variety across countries due to labor markets, but also due to government transfers and government policies and labor market policies. And yet at the same point, there has been a huge upsurge, certainly in the past 20 or 30 years, in government policies designed to encourage women back into the workforce. It seems surprising that we've got this going on, whilst at the same point, many women are being encouraged, particularly after having children, to then go back to the workforce. Yes, uh, there are certainly um, several programs uh, providing incentives for women to return to the labor force. So this is all a matter of comparisons across countries. Uh, researchers have looked at uh, the comparison between limit, uh, women's labor force in Australia with other countries such as Canada, for example. And people have argued that the labor supply of women in Australia is lower than comparable countries, for example, Canada, but also European countries. And there are several reasons provided for that. Some people argue that parental leave provisions and support of childcare is not as developed in Australia compared to Canada. Compared to the Nordic countries, economists have argued that the effective marginal tax rates in Australia are higher. So then you include the means testing in the family benefit schemes along with the tax system. And the decline in your family benefit payments uh, from returning back to work you end up keeping quite a small proportion of your earnings. And people argue that that is more so in Australia than in Nordic countries, for example. And that tends to hit two adult households with children. So it's the women going back to the workforce after having children. It's for those households that the effective marginal tax rates are so high in Australia. Uh, and yet, certainly, the issue of paid paternal leave in Australia is really quite controversial. And uh, in the Nordic countries, they've had it for many years. Mm -hmm. Does this actually prove that those people who are criticising the introduction of schemes like this, saying that it isn't actually going to work, well, it just means that they're wrong, and uh, it obviously does work in other parts of the world? Well, I think evidence shows that it does work in other parts of the world. These things can sometimes take time, and so um, if you look at data immediately following a change in policy, you may not see a big change in behavior. Um, but I do think uh, it works, but it's a whole system of policies and programs. It's not one single policy that seems to work. Now, Australia is uh, quite uh, favorable to women returning back to work in the sense of providing part-time jobs. The uh, incidence of part-time work is very high in Australia compared to other countries. Uh, so that, in a sense, would make it easier for women to go back to work. On the other hand, the growth that we are seeing now is not in sectors where there are lots, a lot of part-time jobs. Mining, for example. Mining is not a sector that offers a lot of part-time jobs. And many of the part-time jobs do seem to be really rather badly paid as well. Yes, there is that too. So um, it's certainly uh, the view of many people that part-time jobs are not the jobs that easily lead to promotion up the scale and to very high-profile uh, jobs. So there is what is called the glass ceiling uh, theory that uh, even if women do get in the same sectors uh, employment in the same sectors as men, uh, promotion through the ranks is much slower for women than for men. And having part-time work is one reason given for that. But how about those women who choose to work full-time? Are we still seeing a divergence now of income between them and their male colleagues? Yes, studies do show that um, women returning to the workforce will have um, a slower progression through the ranks than men, even if they return full-time. And there is a gap in male-female earnings in full-time jobs as well as across full-time, part-time jobs. So what government policies would you like to see that uh, may turn this around? 
Well, I think uh, exploring the um, changes in effective marginal tax rates, where they are occurring and whether there's any scope there to uh, provide more incentives for women to return to the labor force, I think is very important. I think provision of childcare is very important. It has been a very difficult problem to study, but uh, I think we need a better understanding of where the, the lacks are in the system and how we can promote uh, better quality childcare as well as more places. One possibility which could be explored would be to provide incentives to employers to provide affordable, high quality childcare at the workplace. It would uh, provide incentives for women to go back to the workplace at the same time as providing good quality childcare. But that is very expensive. After all, the Nordic countries uh, yes. have really pioneered this development in the workplace, but it comes at a very high price, doesn't it? Yes, and women's work uh, is worth the high price. <laughs> Denise Dwaron, thank you very much. Thank you. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.